Good afternoon and welcome to Assembly Committee on Health and Human Services. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Assemblywoman Garlo. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Here. Assemblyman Orentlicker. Here. Assemblywoman Taylor. Present. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Chair Peters. I am here. Thank you so much. Would you please mark Assemblywoman Gonzalez and Assemblyman Hafen present when they arrive? Few housekeeping announcements. Please make sure your phones and computers are silent so we're not interrupting speakers throughout this afternoon's committee. Uh, members of the public may testify in various ways, all of which are uh, included in the agenda. You may also submit public comment in writing, either in addition to testifying or in lieu thereof. Written public comment may be submitted before, during, or up to 24 hours after the meeting's adjournment. If you wish to testify in person, please sign in at the table by the door and leave your business card so we get um, an accurate record of your name. If you do not testify, you may also want to sign in there so that we have uh, a record of who is interested in these particular bills. To ensure an orderly flow of discussion, all comments, questions, and responses must go through me. Committee members must be recognized by me before we can speak. Additionally, I ask our presenters on the Zoom video call to leave your cameras off and micro microphones muted until it is your turn to present or I direct any questions to you. And when testifying in person, please turn the microphone on to speak and off to listen because we get a nasty reverb if we don't. With that, we'll move on to our agenda. Today we have Assemblyman Orenlicker um, presenting a couple of bills. I'm going to go ahead and open uh, the hearing for Assembly Bill 85 first. This measure establishes procedures to fix rates for certain health care goods and services. I'm going to, Assemblyman Orenlicker, please let me know when you're ready and state your name for the record and may, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Assemblyman David Ornett Licker, Assembly District 20 on the southeast side of Las Vegas. And as the Chair indicates, this is about fixing rates. And I guess you could think of that in two ways, to set rates and to correct rates, because they're too high in many situations. So overall, this bill, AB 85, is about making our health care system fair. And by making it fair, it will help countless residents of Nevada. This bill will help uninsured Nevadans who don't have health care coverage because it's too expensive. Maybe they work for a small business that can't afford to offer health care benefits because insurance premiums are too high. Or maybe they're self-employed and don't make enough money to buy health insurance. Or maybe they're poor, but not poor enough to qualify for Medicaid, and we can't afford to cover them under Medicaid because healthcare is just too expensive. This bill will also help Nevadans who have health care insurance but can't afford the deductibles or other co-payments they have to pay when they seek care. And so they delay seeking care and don't fill, fill their prescriptions and get sicker. So as I said, this is about fair prices. Now it only covers hospitals, surgical centers, and emergency care centers. These are facility fees, not doctor fees. This has nothing to do with physician rates. And uh, as some background, for, especially for those who are new to the committee, this was AB 347 two years ago. And it was the product of a ongoing working group where I you know, a large group of stakeholders. I think we got up to 75 stakeholders and got a lot of input. And since then, in response to that input, I did make some changes. One is to narrow this to just hospitals, uh, surgical centers, and emergency, free standing emergency care centers, and not address physician fees or other individual provider fees. The other um, change, another significant change, there were m many, but the other significant change was as initially proposed, um, the rate setting, this is, we're gonna talk about how do we get to fair fees, 
to have a commission, a government commission to set them. Um, initially, I, I thought that should be um, created as part of Health and Human Services, but a lot of stakeholders said it would be better to have it independent. So now it's, it's in this iteration as an independent commission, although relying on staff at HHS, but the commission itself is independent. So as I said, this is going to help lots of Nevadans. Um, another class of uh, Nevadans will help is workers who have insurance, but they don't see pay increases because their employers have to spend more and more money to pay their employee health care benefits rather than salary. So they see their paycheck inching up. Their benefit package actually goes up, but a lot of it is going to health care. So this bill will make health care more accessible and affordable for the many Nevadans who struggle to get their health care they need. So how is it, what's the secret sauce here? How are we going to make health care more affordable? And the idea here is to do what every other country does, and some states do, and a lot more states used to do. Um, so the motivation, health care costs are too high. So here's some, the latest numbers I have. In the United States, we spend nearly 12000 per person for health care. Switzerland's number two, but it's only 61% of what we spend, just over 7000 Germany. You can see 6,000, 59%. Canada is less than half of what we spend. Japan, 39% of what we spend, under 5,000 a person. And then New Zealand. Now, these are not countries that you have trouble getting good health care. They have very advanced, very accessible health care. And look how much less they spend than we do. And hospital charges are the main reason. We hear a lot about drug charges, and pharmaceutical prices are too high in many cases. But actually, if you're looking at the main contributor to our high health costs, it's hospital charges. And there's a nice RAND study that documents that. Well, why are hospital bills higher, right? Are we pay more than double, most, double a lot of countries, hospital bills are higher. Why? There are a lot of people think, but you know, it's, it's not because we spend more time in the hospital. We actually don't. Other countries, people go to the, have more admissions and spend more time in the hospital. That's not why we spend more. It's not because we're sicker. Sometimes we are sicker, but that doesn't explain it. It's not because we're sicker. It's not because we're more litigious. I mean, we, we may be more litigious, but that's not why our health care costs our hospital costs are higher. It's because our prices are higher. If you get the same service in any of these other countries as you get here, the same quality service, you pay a lot less. We just have higher prices. And why do we have higher prices? Because we rely on insurance companies rather than government to negotiate fees. Right? The hospitals negotiate with insurance companies. I know insurance companies are not very popular in this country, but they don't, they're not the big bad bullies that they sometimes seem to be. Unfortunately, they don't have sufficient leverage with hospitals. Hospitals have a lot of market power, and that's why hospital fees are so much higher. Every other country doesn't allow that kind of negotiation. It, the government participates, doesn't always set the fees, but it can organize them. And what those countries do is make sure the hospitals in their countries can't use their market power. Why do our hospitals have so much market power? Because we're not like we used to be, the local community hospital that provided care. We now have lots of consolidation, lots of mergers, lots of major national companies that own a lot of hospitals, and that gives them a lot more leverage. Even the local community hospital could have leverage if it's the only game in town, and that's true in some communities. But it's hospital market power. You might be wondering, well, antitrust law, isn't that supposed to protect us? And it should, but the antitrust enforcers have not done their job in health care, and we have the, this major consolidation, excuse me, that, that drives up our health care costs. 
I'm just going to silence my computer. There we go. Now, I know hospitals did have struggled some during the pandemic, but their bottom lines didn't a lot because we had federal relief funds. I picked one company. I picked it out partly because I found it easily and partly because they have a number of hospitals in Southern Nevada. This is Hospital Corporation of America to show you their profits. And they took a little dip. This dip here is in the beginning of 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. But you see they quickly rebounded and actually their profit margin, their operating margin exceeded their average right before the pandemic. So yes, there was some turmoil in the healthcare system from the pandemic, but it didn't affect the bottom line of most hospitals. Some hospitals it did affect. So this is national. Uh, and by the way, the uh, CEO of HCA um, compensation in 2021 was over $20 million. So obviously they're doing quite well. All right, what about Nevada? This is national data. I'll give you some Nevada data. This is, okay, so what this shows, I picked five hospitals. They're not at the high, well, some are, I didn't pick the low, the, I wanted to show some of the examples of where the problems are. So there may be a, a little over 20 hospitals. I picked five just to give you a sense. And what this shows, this um, kind of orange line here, shows you what the state average for hospitals, what they charge as a percentage of Medicare. That's kind of the standard benchmark that health economists use. How do hospital charges or anybody's charges in healthcare compare to Medicare? Because Medicare does the best job. It's not perfect. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot of people tell you how Medicare underpays, but it's at about 90% of, of costs. So it's not perfect, but it's the best we have. So on average, and this is by the way, if I had, um, Two years ago when I presented, uh, Nevada wasn't as high. It's interesting if you look, and these data come from the RAND Corporation. Um, two, years, uh, two years ago, we had 2018 data two years ago, and Nevada was actually in the lower end in terms of hospital costs. Since then, this is 2020 data, we've moved to now we're in the upper half. Not sure why we've moved up, but this is not a good thing to move up in. It was much better when we were 45th, now we're 22nd in terms of hospital charges. These are facility charges. Again, I'm focusing on facility charges, not what doctors charge. And you see, on average, we're at 285% of Medicare. And some hospitals, we've got one up north, it's 493% on the far right here, that's 493%. And others, you see, I picked some, there are some that are lower, but you can see close to 300 or more percent of Medicare. As I said, Medicare might be 10% below where it should be, 20%. It's not 100% of where it should be. All right, that's what they're charging. Um, there's a National Association of State Health Plans, a not-for-profit, nonpartisan group that what they do is they look at hospitals. Hospitals, this is all based on public data, by the way. Um, hospitals submit their cost data to Medicare. and so. This organization, NASHP, um, you know, mines the data and figures out what's their break-even point. How do, what do they need to cover their cost? And on average, in Nevada, hospitals need 111% of Medicare to cover their costs. As you can see, it varies from hospital to hospital. Here's a hospital that needs 229% of Medicare to cover its costs. Others are closer to that average. So they. Clearly, Medicare under undercompensates hospitals. And there's also Medicaid costs and so on. And finally, profit margins, same five, using the same five hospitals, you see their profit margins. The one that 28%, uh, you know, I don't know where the right amount is. It's, I'm sure it's above a few percent, 10%, but it's not gonna be this high. These, they don't need these kind of profit margins to stay in business. So the goals of AB 85, ensure that, I, you know, look, I want hospitals to be fairly paid. I want them to cover their costs. I just don't want them to use their market power to charge more, right? It's not a free market. When they have market power, they can use to charge excessive prices. 
So I want them to be fairly paid. I want patients not to have to pay excessive charges because when they do, they can't, they can't afford the care. I want to simplify things, right? You talk to hospitals, how many billing clerks they have. Some hospitals have more billing clerks than they do have healthcare providers because it's so complicated to deal with all these health insurers. If we just have the state set the rates in a fair way, it simplifies the system and we won't have so many, so much of our healthcare dollars sucked up in, in unnecessary administrative costs and then decreases the administrative burdens. Okay, so principles. So this goes, section nine is kind of the heart of the bill. I'll tell you some of the other sections, but section nine is kind of the heart. The idea is kind of what we do with public utilities, right? As I mentioned before, we, we worry about the market power of NV Energy and Southwest Gas. So we don't let them set their rates. We require them to justify their rates for a public utility commission. And what the public utility commission is gives them, I think they use the term just and reasonable, but same idea. And the idea is that we want them to cover their costs, their reasonable costs. We want them to earn a fair and reasonable profit. And if you're wondering, there's lots of case law about that because we've got public utilities. So this is not a new concept. So that's in section 9.1. That's the basic principle for this commission, fair and reasonable fees, uh, cover reasonable costs, fair and reasonable profit. And they would be guaranteed to receive at least Medicare. That's the minimum. No statutory maximum because I don't know what the right amount is. It's going to vary from year to year, from hospital to hospital. It wouldn't make sense. Some states do try to set, we're going to say 160% of Medicare, 180% of Medicare. Who knows what the right amount is? That's why you need to have a commission and we can't do that. So the floor is me Medicare, we'll never go before below Medicare and no statutory maximum because again, it depends on the hospital. So with the state setting fees and again, simplicity, we want fairness, we want simplicity. We won't have this inefficient system of negotiations between hospitals and who knows how many insurers some of them have to deal with. It could be dozens. Okay, what else in the bill? The first few sections, as usual, are definitional. Sections five through seven and nine talk about the independent commission, the first to set up who's gonna be on the commission, how many, how often they meet, nine members that who represent, you know, a diverse range of expertise, some in finance, some in healthcare, some are consumers, some are employers who have to find health insurance for their employees. So the, the bill goes through those. Um, as I said, uh, in section nine, it sets out the requirement that they provide, cover reasonable costs, fair and reasonable profit. And then in section 10, how do we know what, what, what are the factors to ensure that they're fair, treated fairly? Payer mix is important. Some hospitals have more Medicaid patients, more uninsured. So they need higher, they need more money on the private side to cover their costs. So that would be important. Quality of care, we want the high quality providers to be rewarded, or I should say hospitals and other facilities. Um, if you're taking care of sicker patients, that's more expensive. So we wanna take that into account. We wanna reward hospitals and other facilities that have a population health focus that keep the, their their uh, people who are their patients out of the hospital, keep them healthy. We should reward them because we don't always do that. And the, any financial hardship, if you're going to reduce rates, um, it may, you might want, we would want to, where necessary to phase them in. So you can't just change the system overnight. So we, we again, all ways to make sure we treat each facility fairly. What will this mean for the private market? Um, it doesn't, this is not a single payer system. We'll still have the same insurers. We'll actually have more insurers, I think. Um, we're still gonna have uh, insurers competing. Um, they'll just have a common reimbursement structure. We won't have this crazy system where different insurers, different hospitals, dozens of different rates, which don't make sense, no economic sense. 
and that's going to mean lower health insurance premiums, fair pricing for good consumers, and the state budget, because this we all pay for the health insurance for state employees. This will reduce the cost to the state for that. It will mean greater competition. Actually, it not only will leave a free market of competition for health insurers, actually will probably be more health insurers. Because if you want to open a new health insurance plan in, in Nevada, you need to form a network of hospitals and doctors because you need to get a network. You, if you promise them volume, you'll, you know, you'll make them part of your network, your plan, then uh, they can, they'll know they'll get an increased flow of patients and then they'll be willing to offer discounts. Um, you won't need to do that because we'll have fair rates set by the state and now easy for new health companies to come in. And the way we know that is if you look at Medicare Advantage. Go on line to Medicare Advantage, pretend you want to buy a plan and put in your zip code and you'll see dozens of, of options. And Medicare Advantage is, is a private system, a system of private plans that the government implements where they have a common um, rate setting system for reimbursement and you get more competition. Um, as I say, it replaces the complicated, difficult negotiations between providers and insurers with the one. It's, look, you still have to have this rate setting, but it's just one instead of dozens. So it will be simpler. So that's kind of covers what I wanted to say and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Vice Chair Ornlicker, for the presentation. We have several questions from the committee members. I'm going to go ahead and start with Gorolo, um, but as always, please flag me down if you have questions and I haven't gotten your name. Thank you very much, Chair Peters, and thank you so much for your presentation. It was really enlightening. And I do have a question, and I apologize if I missed it in your presentation, but what other states are doing this, and is there any data available that shows that their costs did decrease? A good question. So. Currently, we have a small number. Maryland, Maryland has done, start, did this, oh, let me backtrack. In the 1970s, many states set up these commissions. Interestingly, at the time, hospitals supported it, and it, everybody understood this was a good policy. What happened is, that you, some of you may remember, some of you re have read about, we entered a deregulatory phase in this country where the view was we should remove government law, regu rules and let the free market operate. So a lot of these commissions were disbanded. And um, we've been trying to rely on the free market since the 1970s in healthcare to keep costs down, and it just doesn't work. I don't know any health economist who thinks we can make things work under free market, unre unregulated market, we need uh, government intervention. As I said, the reason for the government intervention is to counteract the market power of hospitals, to do what the antitrust enforcers haven't done. So now, um, Maryland never abandoned its rate regulation. They've gone beyond this model to setting global budgets. So they say to the hospitals, here's your budget for the year. And I think that's something to work toward. I'd love to do that. And I've and, you know, I've started the discussions. Um, so Maryland still does rate regulation um, and Massachusetts does some. But as I say, we because of the deregulatory ethic that started in the 70s and 80s, most states abandoned and now states are realizing we need to figure out and are, are now coming back to do more regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have Assemblywoman Gonzalez next. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. Thank you, Assemblyman, so much for your presentation. Um, I just had a quick question. In Section 6, uh, Point three a it says under the requirements of the independent commission that a person in order to be on the board has to be a citizen and a resident and I was just curious number one the citizen requirement why that's in there and then um, 
just curious what the background was on, on that, and um, thank you. That is a good question. Uh, I, I'll concede, uh, Assemblyman Ornett, looking for the record, I'll concede that I did not pay uh, a lot of attention to some of these um, provisions, including that one. So I, I would need to check with legal and see if there was a reason that they had in mind. Thank you for bringing that up. We do not have legal in the committee right now as they are dutifully drafting bills uh, for our upcoming deadlines. So we can document that as a question for them and follow up with you on that. Uh, Assemblyman Gray, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sir, did you consult with any of the hospitals in the area and are any of them supporting you in this? I, I just not seeing how the plan can actually work. Um, thank you, Assemblyman Arnt Licker, for the record. Um, as I said, two years ago, I had extensive discussions, um, not as much for this bill, but this is sim very similar, it tracks the other bill. So yes, I did talk at some length and we haven't reached agreement. And I told them I'm, c I'm interested in continuing to work and see if we can bridge the divide. But um, I understand that Hospitals have a duty to their shareholders to maximize profits, and this will limit their profits. Follow up, Madam Chair. Please go ahead. Thank you. So the answer was no to that. And I'm assuming that was in Southern Nevada. Did you talk to any of the hospitals up here? Uh, Assemblyman Orrin, looking for the record, yes. Uh, Renown was part of the discussion. I invited the Hospital Association. As I said, when we had the, the stakeholder group, there were, I think, 75 different stakeholders. So this was, I, I've been invited and always welcome input. And I, if you have things to add, please do. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe I should have been a little more clear, clear maybe outside of the uh, urban areas, but have you talked to the rural hospitals? I mean, the ones that would suffer the most from this? Uh, Assemblyman Orrin Licker, for the record, indeed, I spoke with Joan Hall, and as you'll see, one of the ex ex um, the critical access hospitals are not are exempt from this. Would not be this that um, bill does not apply to the critical access rural hospitals. Assemblywoman Taylor, have you next? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, thank you, Assemblyman, Vice Chair, Assemblyman. Of where well, I thought it was, it's it's on. I mean, this is about as close as I usually am. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, um, a couple of questions, if I may, Chair. Thank you very much, and again, thank you, Assemblyman. Just a couple of questions. I, I hate that I missed the conversation last year. Some of this may seem repetitive because I know you've been through a lot of these questions before. Um, if we look at uh, slide seven, it's sir. Pull that back up. This is the slide when you when you looked at uh, just profitability, some of the profit margins. Yes. And 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 know that there. Do we have any information on what is? And you say we don't really know what's uh, where is the right number. Do we have any national average information or anything like that? Where, you know, uh, strong hospitals or you know, hospitals oh. that service their communities. Where do they kind of land? Do we have anything on that? Yeah, I'm sure there. Yo. There is that kind of data. When I said we don't know, I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There are, as I said, there's extensive experience in the public utility rate setting world about what it means to have a fair profit. Mm -hmm. So that information's out there. I just don't know it all right now, but, but it won't be hard to figure that out, what hospitals need. Um, but I'm confident it will not be 23% or 28%. Is there, thank you, and I, I appreciate you're not like, look, I don't happen to have it, I, I get that. It, it, Chair, is there any way that we might be able to have, get that information somehow, from staff somehow, or perhaps, or, yeah. no, maybe? Patrick's looking at me like, no. <laughs> yeah, Assemblyman Orrin Licker, I'll follow, I, I did, did talk you? to the Public Utility Commission people, and I'll follow up with them and see if they can give me a, a sense of what their range is. Yeah, if, if we can have that for hospitals. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that would just be helpful as we start looking at these kinds of numbers. Thank you very much. Um, and then just a question on slide 10, when we, we look at the commission, um, 
no, I'm sorry, not slide 10. When you, I forgot to write down the, 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 slide, the slide number in this one. You mentioned some of the things that the commission, would, that they will be responsible for, some of those rates, I mean, some of those decisions, those things that they would set um, financially. I'm wondering how, what, I just, I want to make sure I understand the scope of their work, right? They, they, I know they're, they're, they're going to set the rates for hospital services, right? Certainly that's clear. Does it extend to, they get to set rates for vendor contracts or employee contracts or is there anything like that or is it, or is there anything that really restricts that this is the hospital, cert you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Some, uh, thank you. Assemblyman Orrant Liquor for the record. No, they, the goal here would be to say to a hospital, as I say, the simplest would be to say, okay, we are, Thank you for showing us your cost data, what your expenses are. We see that um, Medicare, just getting Medicare would not cover your costs. You need 20% more than Medicare. Or maybe you need, I mean, the numbers you tend to see, people use 150%, 160%, sometimes 180%. It depends on the state. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they would say. That's, but and then leave it to them to work out everything else. There is a provision in here to um, promote fair and adequate compensation of their workers. We, we wanna make sure that we give them enough money so that they can pay fair wages. So that's part of the, for them to take, in, the commission to take into consideration. But otherwise it, it would leave how they make their arrangements. Now, it is also important that these have to be reasonable costs, right? And they have to explain why we don't want them to just have a blank check like we used to do in healthcare reimbursement. Whatever your costs were, we'll reimburse. That doesn't work either. So we'll, we'll hold them to justify the costs. Okay, if, if I may follow up to your different. Okay, thank you. Um, so really, it's really about, again, back to those services and the cost for them to provide those services. Um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to see if, if I can imagine a scenario when it may be an employee contract or a contract with a vendor for whatever has to come before the commission and the, and the commission can say, no, I know that's what happened with that bargaining unit or whatever, but no, we don't approve it. It's not enough or it's too much or whatever. I'm, I'm seeing if... If that's how you envision from a, the scope standpoint, or, or did I just go way off somewhere? Which does happen from yeah. time to time. Well, Assemblyman Orrin Liquor, for the record, I mean, they, they wouldn't be passing on specific contracts. No, that would not be part of the mm -hmm. presentation. Okay. What they would do is come in and say, here are these labor costs we have to cover, and, and then the commission would say, okay, that, that's, you gotta cover your labor costs. Got it. Um, it's for the commission to consider those costs. Right. They, okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chair, thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you so much for your questions. Mm -hmm. Assemblywoman Newby, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I have a couple of questions, if that's all right. Um, uh, Assemblyman Orrant Licker, thank you for this presentation. I was wondering, on your data charts that you were uh, referencing on uh, the the rates that the hospitals are charging, are those, do you know if those are the negotiated rates or are those rates absent any sort of uh, negotiated rate from an insurer? That's question number one. And then question number two is, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this contemplates that a rate would be set for individually for each facility. So all of those factors that you lay out in your bill would have to be considered for each separate entity. And then question number three, given that um, the hospitals and, and other facilities would need to provide this commission with all of their um, information on charges and costs and everything, I think maybe they would consider that information to be proprietary. Um, is there any uh, protection in this process or commission to keep that information proprietary? Um, thank you, Assemblywoman. Assemblyman Orrant Liquor for the record. Yes, they would have to provide their data. This is already the same data they provide to Medicare. 
because Medicare requires that kind of data so they can decide how much to reimburse. So it's nothing new, and, and I would certainly give the same protections that, Medi that they already have. When, so that would definitely do that. Um, and these would be facility specific. So, because, um, you know, going to that next one, remember the break even, see the break, these were the break even points. And while they're, they're, some of them come, are similar, you see there's variation in where their break even points. So you would have to tailor the rates to what their break even points are. Um, but, and, and where these numbers, these numbers are based on actual payments by private insurers which wasn't always very available, but the RAND Corporation has done some very good studies uh, with um, health insurers and employers who are willing to share what they actually paid. And um, there are also some states have these all-payer um, databases where their insurers are required and hospitals to report. So we have more and more data, but this is based on actual negotiated rates, yes. If I could just follow up on Assemblywoman Gorlo's, I mentioned a few states that do this across the board. I forgot to mention states like Montana, Colorado, Washington do this kind of rate setting for their public option plans or in Montana for state employee plans. So we're starting to see more states do it in limited parts of their, of health, their health insurance, but this would do it across the board. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Assemblyman Koenig, please go ahead. Thank you, Assemblyman. I'm, I'm going to excuse my ignorance, but I don't quite understand how you get such high numbers over. Okay, so, so in my clinic, I contracted with Medicare and Medicaid, and they tell me exactly what I have to charge and what I'm going to get reimbursed. Well, and so I can't charge a Medicaid or a Medicare patient five times what they're allowable because I can't do the extra onto the patient. I'm contracted with Medicare and Medicaid. So the percentage in the hospitals is of that is, uh, it's got to be over 50% of their patients have got to be Medicare and Medicaid combined. So how are they getting to charging, and I don't know how hospitals charge, but how are they getting to charge 500, 493 times what Medicare pays, it, I, I, how do they bill? I don't understand their billing process. How do they get that high when you're only going to receive what Medicare and Medicaid are going to contract it to pay you? Yes, uh, David, uh, Assemblyman Orrin, looking for the record, thank you for the question. These are what uh, they bill and get paid by private insurers. So you're right, Medicare, Me Medicare and Medicaid set rates, then they negotiate rates with the private insurers, and this is the rate, these are the rates they negotiate with private insurers. In the follow-up, if I may? And the private insurances are agreeing to 500 times Medicare's payment? I'm negotiating incorrectly, I think. <laughs> uh, Assemblyman Orrin, look for the record. Uh, this is an example of the only hospital in town. And if you're a health insurer, you have to deliver a hospital for your members, and if so, they're not. This is this is a good illustration of the market power that hospitals have. Yeah, they have, and and one of the reasons why I'm not including physicians in this, it makes there are a lot more physicians than there are hospitals is one reason. But another reason is, while hospitals drive a very hard bar hard bargain in our state, 285% of Medicare, 22nd highest in the country. Uh, physicians uh, don't have that kind of market power in this state. And so there's not as great a need to regulate physician fees. Yes, yeah, so you're right, providers don't always, it, I was surprised how low, I think in Las Vegas, physicians are maybe 107% of Medicare, not, I mean, in a lot of places, it would be much higher than that. Thank you. Are there other questions from the committee members at this time? 
This is an incredibly complex issue, and it's very difficult to wrap uh, your brain around one component of the cost of medicine when we we have been talking about, at least for the three sessions that I've been here, the varying areas where the cost of, uh, of providing health care has been increasing and changing and what the regulations look like in all of those cases. Um, and Assemblyman Ornlicker, I'd like to ask you about how you think this particular commission would fit within some of the structures that we've implemented, including the surprise billing bill from 2019, I believe, the Patient Protection Commission, again from 2019, the pharmaceutical cost transparency work that began in 2017, and the All Payers Claims Database, which is still trying to be fully implemented. Um, but again, all of that work has been in play for the last five years or so. Can you just talk a little bit about how you envision this fitting into some of those other work we've done in this body? Yeah, thank you, Chair uh, Assemblyman Orant Licker, for the record. Uh, yeah, so we've done some important things. So the surprise billing, for example, did address the problem where you go out of your network, right? You have your plan. They have certain hospitals that are in network who agree to these discounted prices. Although, as we see, 285% of Me Medicare is not as discounted as it could be. But if you go out of network, you could get hit with a much higher bill. So that's an important protection, but it reaches a small percentage overall of hospital bills. For the people who get them, it's a big deal when you get a $100,000 bill when if you were in network, it would be your copayment might be 2000 So it was an important ex extreme example of unfair billing that thankfully we and, and then the federal government closed. Um, the uh, public options, another good example of an important benefit, but unfortunately it reaches a small slice of the healthcare market, the people who buy their own plans. Most of us are either on a government plan or an employer plan. So we've, we've hit certain important areas of concern where of especially high prices, but this is designed to reach across the board. So for those of us who stay in network or are on employer plan, uh, what we've done so far doesn't help us with our hospital costs. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew like how much work had been going into this particular issue area. And as we've seen in um, some of this presentation, the cost of health care has not gone down. Um, and it's, it's, but it's complex. There are many players. Um, I wanted to ask about the benchmarks that exist today. So you mentioned one, Medicare, and then we have Medicaid. Um, but we don't, uh, as a body here today, we haven't talked about the quantity of folks who are on those um, those plans and that are able to negotiate those rates. Um, and then also the complexity of we have uh, uh, many folks, the majority of Medicaid patients or recipients who are on MCO plans, and we don't have transparency of what those reimbursement rates look like. So can you talk a little bit about more about what benchmarks exist out there and how frequently they're used to drive um, the reimbursement rates that we're seeing um, and how that might interplay with some of the costs that the RAND Corporation are seeing? Uh, thank you, Chair. Assemblyman Orant Licker, for the record. Um, so Medicaid I would love to see Medicaid reimbursement rates go up, and that's why hopefully you'll see Assembly Bill 197, which is designed to do that. Uh, but Medicare really is the standard benchmark in this country. Every state that proposes rate regulation of some kind, whether it's surprise billing or across the board or a public option, they all start with Medicare and think, okay, how much over Medicare, or when you look at academic proposals, you'll see they'll commonly say 125% or 150%. Um, Medicare is universally viewed as the best benchmark. It's certainly not perfect, and I'm sure some of the testimony will be about the imperfections of it. And I'm, but overall, the right now, Medicare is estimate is about not cover is it about 90% of cost. So it's it's not perfect misses some things, and that's why this commission isn't bound by Medicare. It's 
only that's a, that's the minimum, and then it moves up as needed with no statutory cap. I I, th I thought it inappropriate to s say 160 or whatever, because that is going to change over time. You can't come back and redo the statute every two years as Medicare rates evolve and healthcare costs change. But Medicare um, that anybody who writes and you know legislates in this area or writes in this area as an academic uses Medicare as the benchmark. And, and I think it's important to note that when we're talking about the analysis of Medicare reimbursement rates against the cost of providing health care, that that's generalized rather than specific to the state, or am I incorrect in that? I'm sorry. That 90 percent, that Medicare oh. covers 90 percent, is that that's generalized across the country, not specific to the state of Nevada. Um, and when we look at th at, at the cost of doing business in the state of Nevada, we're just seeing that increase um, at a higher rate than other states at this point. So I, I wanted to to talk, <laughs> add that complexity to the ma the mix as well. Yeah, Assemblyman Orton, looking for the record, that is important. And Medicare does vary rates, looks at regional costs, and so hot regions where there are higher labor costs or other costs will get higher rates. Absolutely. Thank you. That's good to note. Uh, my last question, and again, I'm looking at the committee. If there are other questions, flag me down. But my last question today, today is um, about why or did you consider limiting the um, independent commission to looking at uh, benchmarks for our state plans or including the potential public option plan that's in the work uh, being de developed um, as we speak. Um, or, uh, yeah, can you talk about whether you considered limiting it to just those um, and, and some of the factors that uh, went into your thoughts on, on how broad this is? Uh, Assemblyman Orton, looking for the record, good question, Chair. Two years ago, I did actually, during the discussions, approach the public employee benefit plan, say, could we do this, start with you? Because that's what Montana did, and it's been very successful in Montana. And they weren't ready to do it, and, and, but that's certainly something that would make a lot of sense to, to start there and um, demonstrate its value and then um, expand. But it's been, and Montana is a good example because it has a lot of rural hospitals, um, and they were able to, they've been able to implement it successfully and um, across the state. So that's certainly something I, I will thank you for reminding me to reconnect with PEB and see where they are on this um, this year. Thank you for your responses today. Are there any other questions from the committee before we move into testimony? Thank you so much for your presentations today. We are going to go ahead and move into support testimony on Assembly Bill 85. If you are in Carson City or Las Vegas, please approach the table um, for sub, uh, testimony and support. Is there anyone in Carson City? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to provide support testimony on Assembly Bill 85? Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone on the public comment, uh, I'm sorry, on the public line who would like to provide support testimony on Assembly Bill 85? Callers, if you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 85, please press star nine now. Good afternoon, I'm Chair Peters and committee members. For the record, my name is Matilda Guerrero. That's M-A-T-H-I-L-D-A-G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O. And I'm calling on behalf of Battleborn Progress. We're in unwavering support of Assembly Bill 85 and we thank Assemblyman Ortlicker for sponsoring this critical measure. My husband is a first responder and he's worked in the hospital settings for several years now. And I can't begin to tell you how many times he's come home and told me about the number of patients he's come across that do not want to seek health care because of the high cost of, of hospital bills. Hospital rates must be reined in with more transparency and oversight with over the hospital industry. And we hope that this committee believes so too. Thank you again, Assemblyman, for sponsoring this critical measure. And I hope that this committee supports it too. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone else on the public line that would like to provide support testimony for Assembly Bill 85? There, there are no other callers to provide testimony at this time. Thank you for that. I did forget to mention that we, because of time limitations, are limiting our support, opposition, and neutral testimony to 20 minutes. Like last week, I was a little flexible on this because we had a various number of people wanting to testify in those areas, but we do have time limitations. So I'm going to start with a 20-minute timer, and we'll see where we're at um, for opposition testimonies. So I'm going to open opposition testimony. Anybody in opposition may approach the table, um, fill in seats as you go, and uh, you have two minutes to speak. Please state your name for the record, and um, if you didn't leave a business card, spell it for us so we have an appropriate collection of your name. I will start down here in Carson City, and we will move through as we go. Uh, please remember to state your name, and you may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Kelly. I'm the CEO of the Nevada Hospital Association. Uh, we oppose AB 85. More than half of the acute care hospitals had a negative operating margin in the first three quarters of 2013. Hospitals are having difficulty operating under the current system. AB 85 starts hospitals at a Medicare rate. Changing the reimbursement system to a Medicare system would cause financial havoc for hospitals. <laughs> Nationally, Medicare pays only 87% of a hospital's cost to provide a service. I'm not talking about hospital charges, I'm talking about 87% of the cost to provide the service. Hospitals must be able to shift underpayments by Medicaid and Medicare to other payers. This bill would eliminate that cost shift and place hospitals in financial jeopardy. We question the need for a rate setting system. Nevada's health care expenditures are among the lowest in the country. The Kaiser Family Foundation ranks Nevada third in the nation for the lowest health care expenditures per capita. Forbes ranks Nevada among the top five states in the nation where health care is least expensive. Forbes also found that Nevada was in the top five states where overall health care spending grew the least over a recent five-year period. Nevada ranks positively on another national benchmark. The Affordable Care Act's average uh, benchmark premium the Kaiser Family Foundation ranked Nevada as having the eighth lowest average benchmark premium in 2023 in the nation. Rate setting is often used when competition doesn't exist. You see it when companies are granted exclusive rights to provide services such as power, water, or sewage. Rate setting is established so that the companies don't overcharge customers. In our case, hospital competition is alive and well. In the Las Vegas market, we have numerous hospitals competing with one another on price. UMC, UHS, HCA, Prime, and Dignity Healthcare are all active in the market and compete with one another. We have reached two minutes, Mr. Kelly. I realize that people speak at different rates, so I, I understand. If you have written comments, though, you, you can provide them to staff, and we'll make sure that all your comments get in the record and distributed to the entire committee. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. It's George Ross, uh, G-E-O-R-G-E-R-O-S-S, -E on behalf of HCA Healthcare. First of all, the data that was presented on behalf of my, about my client, we believe to be inaccurate and misinterpreted, and we wish the sponsor had taken the opportunity to run that bias beforehand so we could discuss it and, and correct it. Uh, let me make these points. Uh, first of all, this is a very political uh, board. It, it serves at the whim of the governor. Uh, a lot of the policies that this would pre present are, are, you can see it with the Patient Protection Commission. Uh, you, this gives you, because it can change so radically, you may get one set of policies, one set of interpretations every four years or every eight years. It, what it provides is regulatory uncertainty. Nothing is worse for private sector investors, and like it or not, Southern Nevada is almost completely dependent upon private hospital investment for the growth of access to care and improvement of access to care in Nevada. The last thing a private sector company needs to confront is regulatory uncertainty. You cannot be certain that whatever you make your decisions on, whatever those basis is going to be there in a few years. 
Uh, number two, the, this is going to lead to a major increase in the bureaucracy of the state the, the, for the department that is currently, according to yesterday's testimony by the director, 28% understaffed in finance. Let's put it this way. Every single service in the hospital is going to have to be go and appeal. Not one Medicare covers the cost nowhere. A typical Sunrise has at least 30 lines of service overall. You break that down, you get hundreds. Every single one of those services is going to come in and appeal you uh, that, 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 to get a reasonable rate. So every single one, you're going to need a very large staff of highly skilled MBA type analysts with healthcare backgrounds to even remotely get the right decisions. And even then, as soon as the board changes, those could change on you. Yes, I understand that you, maybe you might not have to take every collective bargaining agreement to these, to the, these folks, but they're fair, very clearly in the law, it says fair and reasonable labor costs. We've reached what? two minutes, okay. Mr. Ross. Thank you so much for your comments. And of course, you are, well, you are more than welcome to send in written comments to the committee. We'll make sure those get distributed to Can everyone. I have 30 more seconds, just 30 more? 30 more seconds. Yeah. Oh, with, if I allow you 30 more seconds, then I allow Mr. Kelly 30 more seconds, and I apologize, but we just need to make sure that we okay. are able to get everybody in in the time frames that we All have. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Hi, members of the committee and <clears throat> chair. Uh, my name is Isaac Tenorio, I-Z-A-C-K. Tenorio, T-E-N-O-R-I-O, -O, with Strategy 60, today representing the Valley Health System of Hospitals. In the interest of time, I'm just going to echo the comments of my previous testimonies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Wiz Rizard, W-I-Z-R-O-U-Z-A-R-D. I'm with Americans for Prosperity, Deputy State Director. On behalf of more than 100,000 activists with our organization, uh, we urge you to vote no on AB 85, which creates another bureaucratic commission called the Independent Commission on Rates for Healthcare Services to control and fix the rates charged by medical care facilities, surgical centers, uh, patients, uh, ambulatory services uh, for patients' goods and services. Uh, if our goal is to attract and have the best health care in the nation, a bill like this simply does the opposite. Price controls cause scarcity and are never helpful to consumers. Our state should work on empowering every person to attain success, contribute to his or her community, and live productive, meaningful life. If passed, if, if passed however, this bill would not create a health care system that delivers quality care at the cost that Nevadans can afford. Like any other market, competition has been more effective at driving down costs and creating better choices uh, than price fixing ever can. Although well-intentioned, price fixing does more to limit available supply than to improve it. Doctors, nurses, and hospitals should be free to compete to offer the best health care at the best price that meet the, the needs of their patients. And for reasons that we've shared and others have shared, we urge you to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Peters, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Brian Clevin, B-R-I-A-N-K-L-E-V-E-N. I am the Nevada Market Chief Financial Officer for Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican, which is the only not-for-profit faith-based health system in all of Southern Nevada. Uh, we do not have shareholders. We proudly serve, and in fact, it is our privilege to serve in the best interests of the communities that we operate in. And I'm here in opposition today uh, of AB 85 and agree with my colleagues that have spoken before. There are so many unknowns related to this bill that it is extremely difficult for our team to model what kind of impact this would have on Dignity Health St. Rose. Medicare rates, as stated before, do not cover costs. Uh, Medicaid rates are far worse, and there is no guarantee that the state or this rate commission would pay providers more than Medicare rates. Modeled at rates set at Medicare levels, that issue alone would result in a $233 million bottom line reduction to Dignity Health St. Rose and the hospitals we operate, ambulatory surgery centers, medical group, and micro hospitals that we operate in the greater Las Vegas area. Because Dignity Health St. Rose is a not-for-profit system, any operating model excess is redistributed and reinvested back into the community that we serve to pay for charity care and to support Nevada's already limited health structure. In 2022 alone, during very financially challenging times due to the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Dignity Health St. Rose contributed almost 112 million in community benefits and charity care as part of our operating model. Dignity Health St. Rose has been a part of Southern Nevada since 1947. We've been there 76 years living the mission of the Adrian Dominican Sisters and we proudly do it, but this bill would jeopardize our ability to adequately care for patients and provide care. A rate commission is the wrong thing for Nevada. Thank you for your time and thank you for serving as elected officials in the great state of Nevada. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Peters and committee members. My name is Sarah Watkins. I am the executive director for the Nevada State Medical Association. Our members across all specialties of the association oppose this bill as it could negatively impact a provider's ability to negotiate rates and further practices to remain solvent and available to provide care to Nevada patients. <clears throat> it is not about the solvency of the physicians, it is about the ability of their practices to continue to provide care, which is dependent on the practice's solvency, not the physicians. This also could be a direct effect on the overall potential barriers to access to care for patients. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this bill. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Peters and members of the committee. Lindsay Knox with McDonald Crono here representing the Nevada Orthopedic Society. Um, we currently believe that fixing rates uh, would create a loss of service line. Healthcare entities would be exiting the market and would, even, would be even more difficult to provide adequate medical care to Nevada citizens. Um, as a recent patient to the Reno Orthopedic Clinic's uh, Ambulatory Surgery Center, I expect quality care. And I know that the rate that I paid and the number that I saw when I signed that piece of paper saying what I would be paying pays for the nurses, my physician, my anesthesiologist, and that facility, all of which I believe was the best care I could have asked for. And with this, believe that that would be diminished. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Peters and committee members. Uh, my name is Chris Bossy, um, and I am here today representing Renowned Health, uh, the only private not-for-profit in um, Reno and Sparks area. Um, we are opposed to AB uh, 85 and support the testimony of the folks uh, before me opposing this bill. Um, I had a whole bunch of things written out, and I don't want to waste your time with a bunch of detail. I do think that um, the intention of rate regulation, if we were, if it were to work perfectly, my fear is is that we would you would end up potentially for facilities you could end up paying more as. Patrick Kelly, the president of the hospital association, mentioned early, earlier, more than half of us are losing dollars from operations. So if this rate commission were to actually take all the underfunding that happens from Medicaid, Medicare, and uninsured that we provide now as the safety net facility in Northern Nevada, fold that into rates for commercial products in Northern Nevada, add a fair rate of return, right now my organization is losing uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars, the rates that I would have to be paid would be significantly higher than I receive today in order to make up for that shortfall. So I just urge you to really pay attention about, about Nevada specifically. I think we have unusual dynamic as it relates to Medicaid and just how underfunded we are in this state in those in 75% of the population that we serve is are those programs. So we're only talking about rate fixing on tw about 25% of the population we serve. And if we were actually going to do what the assemblyman indicated, we could end up with much higher rates. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Helen Foley, and I am representing the Nevada Association of Health Plans. Uh, NVAHP is an organization, a trade organization, of the 10 member companies that provide commercial health insurance and government programs in Nevada. I do apologize to you. I just got our uh, letter to the committee uh, manager uh, today. And so I will submit that for the record and we agree with everything that's been said in opposition. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate the letter and look forward to reading that. Please go ahead when you're ready. 
Good afternoon, Chair Peters and members of the committee. For the record, Christina Kleist with Brownstein here today representing the Northeastern Nevada Regional Hospital in Elko. Uh, we also are opposed to this bill and echo the concerns mentioned and submitted by the Nevada Hospital Association and support the testimony of others in opposition today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone else in Carson City who would like to come up for opposition testimony? Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and move into Las Vegas. Uh, please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Peters and members of the committee. I'm Emily Osterberg. I'm here representing the Henderson Chamber of Commerce and our over 1,800 members. Forcing fixed hospital rates based on Medicare costs would not cover the full cost of care, causing hospitals and services to close across the state. Because of these concerns, the Henderson Chamber opposes AB 85. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas who would like to provide opposition testimony to AB 85? Seeing none, I would ask BPS to uh, open the public line for t opposition testimony on AB 85. Caller, if you would like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 85, please press raise hand in your Zoom window or star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller, you are unmuted on our end. You may begin. Caller, can you unmute on your end? You are unmuted on ours. Chair, it appears we are having some difficulties with this caller testifying. Thank you for letting me know. We can come back after our neutral testimony and see if we can figure that out for them. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and Chair, open. they have just joined. Oh, please add them to the line. Thank you so much. Caller, you may begin. Sorry about that. Uh, Marcos Lopez, M-A-R-C-O-S, L-O-P-Z, Nevada Policy. Uh, Nevada Policy opposes Assembly Bill 85. More government price controls into the healthcare market is not the solution. There are very few economic questions that have as much agreement among economists than the failure of price controls. There's an extensive body of economic literature that has repeatedly shown, regardless of the good of service, price controls always have negative consequences. And this bill certainly will lead to further price shifting and reduced healthcare options for Nevada. This is the most fundamental lesson of economics is that the intersection of supply and demand determines price. For too long, the government has been restricting price competition in the market by artificially limiting the supply through restrictive licensing schemes that prevent healthcare professionals from operating across straight lines in certificate of need laws. There is a ton of work that we need to do to help fix our economic, our economic system and our healthcare system, but this is not the solution. We should be looking to ways to reduce the distortive and destructive effects of existing interventions, not going to a full command and control uh, of our healthcare sector. This is it paramount to the efficiency of the Soviet Union, what we're going to see if we go down this path. Thank you. I'm sorry, before you hang up, can you let, uh, say the organization that you're with again? And Nevada Policy. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anyone else on the public comment line for opposition testimony for Assembly Bill 85? There, there are no other callers at this time. All right, we're going to go ahead and move into neutral testimony, and we'll take neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 85 here in Carson City first, and then we'll move to Las Vegas and the phone lines. Please state your name for the record. You may begin when you're My ready. My name is Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E. Uh, I'm neutral for a variety of reasons, but I'm a psychiatrist, which means I'm sort of left of center on most things. Anyway, until recently, psychiatrists actually earned less than pediatricians, which is hard to believe, but now we're doing much better. Um, there's no profit in Medicare. I've learned that from working in what are called DRG, Diagnosis Related Group Exempt 
Jero's psych units, I have literally kept a hospital alive because of the 10-bed Jero psych unit I ran that got them the revenue they needed to underwrite the rest of the hospital. We need to get every willing Nevadan to actually just get insurance. That was the intent of Obamacare until the Supreme Court gutted that element of it. There's a caution to this. If we don't take care of sick people when they're early in their illness, when they pr could benefit from pre preventive care, we're going to get a sicker cohort of patients that will cost more to treat. The deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill has led to people now living on the streets, homelessly eating out of dumpsters, and worse, they're not getting basic medical care or they're getting inadequate care. We've actually heard from our commissioner of the prison system that not only are his inmates majority violent and sexual predators, but they're also mentally ill substance abusers. So we're going to pay for these people somewhere. The idea, I think, that's coming forth in this legislation and why I'm neutral that needs to be resolved is how we answer all of these societal questions because what's being debated is fundamentally a national health plan. I just want to leave you with a chilling prediction of my grandfather in 1964. He also was a physician and he said health care was over as a consequence of Medicare. I assure you health care is not over and I still am alive. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in Carson City who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 85? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 85? Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone on the public line who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 85? No, there are no other callers at this time. Thank you. I'd like to invite the bill sponsor back for your closing remarks, if you would like. Please remember to state your name for the record before you begin. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, I have a, a David Assemblyman Orient Liquor for the record. A few comments. Uh, Mr. Kelly gave some data points which seem to make it look like maybe things are rosy. But I want to give you maybe the most important data point, and that is how many, how, where do we rank as a state in the percentage of our citizens and residents who are uninsured? We're um, eighth worst in the country in terms of uninsured rate. So to me, that tells us we need to do something now to, to make sure we reach people. We shouldn't have that kind of levels of uninsurance. Um, we've heard that hospitals will get not enough money or they'll get too much money. It'll go down, it'll go up. But what the bill language is very clear, hospitals will be fairly paid. That's the standard. They'll cover their reasonable costs, they'll get a fair profit. So no, they're not gonna be underpaid by this bill. They're gonna be fairly paid. Um, in terms of people's concern about price fixing, we already have price fixing by insurance companies. It's, the only question is who's going to do it. And what the reason why I brought this is because the market isn't working. Hospitals are exercising, exploiting their market power. It's an un, it's not a level playing field. And all this is about, about is making sure it's a fair setting of prices because we have an unfair system now. And then finally, I want to reemphasize, we heard from a lot of doctors groups about how this will affect them. Uh, this won't, this is about facilities, not physicians. I understand their concern that if we regulate facilities now, maybe next bill will be about physicians, but this, that's not my intention. This bill is only for facilities. So I appreciate all the time today, and your very helpful questions. And look forward to further discussion. Thank you, Vice Chair, for your comments. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 85. Give our Assemblyman a moment to collect himself for uh, and prepare himself for the next bill. Thank you, Chair. And Jennifer Richards, will, if it's okay, will join me? Yes, please. The next bill we are going to hear today is Assembly Bill 119. This bill came out of the Interim Committee 
on Judiciary, the Joint Interim Committee on Judiciary, I believe, um, but pertains to Health and Human Services, which is why it came to our committee. Um, we This will be the first time we will, we're really hearing about this issue, um, so be prepared with questions, please, and thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 119. Please remember to introduce yourselves for the records. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Assemblyman David Orient Licker, Assembly District 20, for the record. And I'm honored to present AB 119. This bill would create a committee to study vulnerable adult uh, fatalities. So when we have a vulnerable adult who dies, and it, there's a suspicion that there may have been maltreatment, to study, this committee would study those fatalities so we better understand the causes of these deaths and how to reduce them. The proposal for this committee was initiated by Jennifer Richards from the uh, Aging and Disability Services Division and DHHS in a July 8th letter to the Interim Committee on Judiciary. And the letter outlined several recommendations for, commi for committee action, including the creation of this kind of a committee. As Ms. Richards observed, Nevada currently has fatality review teams for domestic violence, children, and maternal mortality. Nevada's older adult population is one of the fastest growing in the country and continues to grow. In addition, case data for adult protective services continues to increase. The committee that she proposed and that's in this bill can address the opportunity in Nevada to develop an elder abuse fatality reviews team. And this kind of a team can review deaths resulting from or related to elder abuse to learn about and improve the response of adult protective services, healthcare providers, law enforcement officers, prosecutors, victim assistance providers, and other stakeholders. The, what, what they learn as they review these fatalities can be used to promote policy changes in both government and private agencies, identify gaps and barriers to service for victims prior to death, increase public awareness, and in positively impact the safety and health of Nevada residents. And the American Bar Association has also discussed the, import, the value of these kinds of review teams, and they've been successful in other states. So I'll do a little walking through, very quick walking through the bill, and then I'll rely on Ms. Richards to uh, help me answer questions. So sections two through seven define key terms in the bill. Section eight establishes the committee and defines its membership. And then sections 9 and 10, starting on page 4, line 18, set out the responsibilities of the committee to review the, the when you've got a death in the state that's suspected or known to have been caused by maltreatment, and then investigate what's, what happened, what, how can we um, do better in the future. Section, so sections 9 and 10 set out the responsibilities of the committee. Sections 11 and 12 describe the actions the committee can take and the public records it can access to carry out its review responsibilities. We also have a conceptual amendment to ensure that the committee's work will lead to the necessary changes. Um, so one of that is the review, their review, their reports that they make every year will go to the Attorney General and the Interim uh, Committee on Health and Human Services. If in an odd year or the regular session of the legislature, and also require the Attorney General to actually develop a plan to address the findings. This committee will say, here's what we can do to reduce fatalities, and we want the Attorney General to develop a plan to address the findings, uh, cr take corrective actions, and recommend policies, and to hold a public hearing concerning its plan. So we really get follow up, ensure that the reports don't get lost. And then a require a representative of the committee or of Ms. Richards' office to present the findings, corrective actions, and policy recommendations uh, to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health during when it's meeting during the interim. So um, with that, if Ms. Richards, would you like to add anything before we take questions? Um. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. 
Jennifer Richards, Chief Elder and Disability Rights Attorney for the State of Nevada under the Aging Disability Services Division. Uh, I'm open to any questions that you may have regarding this legislation at this time. Thank you so much for being with us today and for bringing this bill. I have several questions from the committee. I'm going to go ahead and start with Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so I just have a couple questions to just really understand um, the board and um, forgive me. This is my first time on HHS, so a lot of these questions are just how this will function. Um, question under, sorry, let me grab it. Um, it says that, so under section 8.2, Three, sorry, 3B says that they will be without compensation but are entitled to receive per diem and travel expenses. And then um, in section not in section nine, oh no, wait, hold on, sorry. In in section eleven, um, it talks about consulting with experts to ensure that data is being collected, and then it also talks about employing such persons as deemed necessary. So is this board looking to hire people um, because in the first section it says that they won't um, be getting paid but that they'll be getting per diem but then it says they can allow to employ people and then along with that in section 11 number one consulting with experts um, is the board not the experts I was just curious what that means um, and then my other question um, Head and start oh yeah, there, yeah and then sorry. we can go on Perfect. to the next question Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, to you, through you, to the Assemblywoman. Please go ahead and go directly to the Assembly person, but would you state your name for the record? Oh, uh, Jennifer Richards, Chief Elder and Disability Rights Attorney, Aging and Disability Services Division for the record. Uh, Assemblywoman, the team is intended to be a multidisciplinary team of professionals from across the state, typically uh, coroner's offices, uh, professionals from adult protective services, the members of the team are not paid to be part of the team, but the division would reimburse expenses as necessary. That's the allowance you see in Section 3B. Uh, and they would be tasked then with uh, reviewing and developing the scope and protocol through regulations of how the team will operate and what that review entails. Okay, thank you. Um, we, oh, sorry, one more thing. Oh, yeah. uh, the division at this time has not placed any kind of fiscal impact on the bill. That may be something that needs to be addressed in future budgets, but at this time, there's no uh, fiscal impact on the legislation. Thank you so much, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. So how is there no fiscal impact if we're reimbursing for per diem and travel expenses? That, that sounds expensive. <laughs> Uh, directly to the Assemblywoman Jennifer Richards, Chief Elder and Disability Rights Attorney for the record. Uh, the division's hope is to utilize technology as much as possible to facilitate uh, the meetings and uh, potentially use any other budgetary funds that are available as necessary. We currently have multidisciplinary teams authorized in state statute, but they're on the uh, micro and mezzo level addressing specific cases and those meet virtually across the state through adult protective services again that may be a budgetary issue in the future but at this time there's no fiscal impact indicated thank you so much um cecilia gonzalez district okay Sorry, real quick. No, you're fine. Um, we will come back to okay, you for questions, but one of our colleagues has to leave for a, a meeting here, so I'm going to uh, ask Assemblywoman Thomas to please ask your question before you have to go. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for this presentation. My uh, question actually has to deal with uh, Section 8, um, Subsection 2, uh, the Director. So who appoints the director? How did you come up with the director? You know, is the director appointed by um, the, the, the uh, governor or, you know, and I understand that the director will, uh, you know, um, select six 
and not more than 12 members. But I want to know how does the director get to be the director? I'm going to jump in because I think it's just not defined in this particular bill, but I think it's inherent in the section um, that in this particular bill we're looking at the Department of Health and Human Services, and then the director would be the director of the Department of Health and Human Services. If that's incorrect, please correct me, but I think that that's a, it's that not specifically defi defined in here, but it's a part of this particular statutory section. Should it be? <clears throat> Uh, that's a good legal question. We can follow up with our legal staff and make sure that that's it. Yes, Thank please. You. Okay. Thank you so much. I have a, um, a couple more people, and then I get you on the list. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and come back to Assemblywoman Gonzalez if you have another question. Okay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Two short ones. Um, Cecilia Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. Um, under the oh, – sorry, I want to get the right section. Section 12 – Subsection 2, number A, the multidisciplinary team to review the death. So sorry, section 4, data. Sorry, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> which we could connect offline. But for this one in particularly, um, it says, may use data collected concurring a death that is known or suspe suspected to have occurred. Um, are we implementing like a new data system for this? Are they just working with other offices to get that data? And then um, just my last question. Um, under the conceptual amendment, is the attorney general's office is the attorney general's office okay with tasking them to address the findings in a plan? Um, because I thought the intention is that they're finding a plan and a solution. Um, and so I was just curious why we were giving that to the Attorney General's office as well. Thank you so much. Assemblyman Orrin, looking for the record. I'll start with the second question and then defer to Ms. Richards on the first. Um, good question. I do, this is, uh, I haven't had a chance yet to, to talk to the AG. I do know that they already work with the, the division that uh, Ms. Richards heads on in this area and that they already coordinate when there are concerns about um, mistreatment of, of vulnerable adults. So um, they're already involved in this, and I'll touch base to make sure they're comfortable with this additional responsibility. Uh, Jennifer Richards, Chief Elder and Disability Rights Attorney, Aging Disability Services Division for the record. Um, first, before I answer your question, uh, Assemblywoman, I'd just like to highlight that Data in this area is very difficult to obtain. Um, adult mis mistreatment, uh, maltreatment is subversive, it's underreported. Um, according to the National Center on Elder Abuse, one in 10 community dwelling adults experience abuse in the prior year. Then um, if you look at individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities, they're four to 10 times more likely to be abused than their non-disabled peers. According to a study, Less than one in 14 cases actually make it to the authorities to be reported. And so we have pieces of the puzzle at different agencies, but there's no central repository that addresses adult maltreatment, and this team would fill that systems gap and collect those pieces across the spectrum, compile that data, and give us actionable items. Um, an example that um, I have in my notes is Adult Protective Services had um, 231 deaths in uh, the state fiscal year 2022. Um, we don't correlate those deaths with the coroner's office, for example. Um, there's not communication, perhaps, with facility deaths due to neglect in, in one central space. So it's not creating a new database. It's really taking the pieces of the puzzle that exist in different sectors and compiling that so we can get a clear picture of how we can help Nevadans because every person, regardless of age or disability, has a right to live abuse-free um, in our state. And as we grow, as our population grows, uh, especially our um, individuals with cognitive disabilities such as dementia, we're the fastest growing state for individuals with dementia. They're more um, subject to abuse. 
uh, we need to have that clear picture so that we can improve our system to respond to those needs. Thank, Thank you. you. I look forward to continuing our conversations offline. Thank you. I want to direct um, the committee's attention to two of the handouts that were given to us um, related to the research done on elder abuse. And um, I think it's it's easy to think that adults should be able to take care of themselves, but there are points in life where um, we need the help, extra help, and um, it's not necessarily a, a sexy or hot topic. Um, but we are constantly trying to drive folks into um, the geriatric research space and geriatric care space because this is a growing population with a very uh, a variety of issues, um, and we are we are looking at. Um, and I appreciate that that that. Uh, follow-up commentary because I was wondering about the, the research that's already been done in this area. We have a variety of state bodies that already look at, um, uh, at elder abuse issues and I was wondering what this was going to do um, in relation to all of those. I think you clarified that for me really well. We have a couple of other folks on my list. I'm going to go ahead uh, to Assemblyman Wen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I was... Um actually trying to read your mind a little bit. In terms of along the same line of what uh, Chair Peter just said, uh, my question sitting here just looking at the language of this is that it's, it's under the, the intent, it's under the Director of Health and Human Services to, to organize this body. But I'm wondering if I um, remember correctly, are there other bodies in the state right now, whether it's the Governor Commission or um, uh, different commission that exists that already looking at aging and looking at um, uh, issue dealing with the elderly community. Are there other existing body that deals with this or this is something that is um, need to be unique and be separated under Health and Human Services? Uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Richards, Chief Elder and Disability Rights Attorney, Aging Disability Services Division for the record. There is not currently a fatality review team that addresses vulnerable adults. There exist other teams that have a different focus. Um, certainly there are other bodies and boards and commissions that address issues pertaining to older adults um, and people with disabilities, but there is not a team that has a focus specifically on system gaps, improvements for victim services, and um, deaths that result from th those instances. Currently, there are 35 teams operating across the country, uh, according to the Mer American Bar Association. They've done um, studies to demonstrate the efficacy of these teams and have demonstrated how they improve systems in these states um, across the board. Where the teams are housed varies state by state. Um, in some states, the team is housed within the Attorney General's office. In some states, it's housed within Health and Human Services. Uh, candidly, the Assemblyman and I had that discussion candidly. And um, because Adult Protective Services already facilitates a multidisciplinary type team, it seemed that the team fit within DHHS at this time to align with the social services need. Um, and address those victim services uh, aspect. But it would bookend very well with the work of the Attorney General's office. They have a special unit and they are part of this legislation and specifically noted um, in, in the bill language. A uh, quick follow up, Chair. Um, just wanted to be clear, and again, um, I just want to, before my question, thanks, uh, Assemblyman. Um, just to include the represent the racial, ethnic, linguistic, and geographic diversity. That's an amazing line, so thank you for that. That's usually my line of question in every single bill, so thank you for getting that already in there. Uh, but in terms of the previous um, paragraph before that, in terms of the makeup of the committee, um, I know that is very general in here in terms of giving it 
the ability to appoint um, a very diverse group, but I just want to make sure that we specify some more things. So this is just a suggestion if we can maybe spell out law enforcement roles a little bit more specific, just because there's just so many layers of law enforcement, and I want to make sure that we specify the types of law enforcement that needs to be in there, as well as social worker. And I think that those are two things that I'm missing that I see in this right there. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, may I respond? Uh, thank you, Jennifer Richards, Chief Elder Disability Rights Attorney, Aging Disability Services Division, for the record. Um, our intent in leaving it a little broad was that the team would be developed by regulation so that it could adapt to the changing needs in the state. I know California's fatality team, for example, reviewed COVID-related deaths in facilities um, that they identified were part of neglect, isolation, uh, et cetera, and they had the flexibility to pivot and determine what deaths they would focus on and what deaths that they wouldn't and who may be necessary to be part of the team. And so um, our thought during the um, discussion of the bill was to leave that somewhat broad so that the, the team makeup could reflect the need of the state as that ebbs and flows perhaps, but certainly uh, local law enforcement, um, adult protective services, social workers, um, other healthcare entities may all be part of the makeup of the team. Um, and that would be spelled out through regulations once the legislation is adopted by the division. I appreciate that insight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question and the responses. Um, I have Assemblywoman Newby. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I have a question about it's section 12, um, subsection 3 at the end of that one, and then subsection 5. It seems that uh, section 12 um, kind of contemplates that there's uh, investigation um, by law enforcement into the situation. Um, and that the information coming out of that investigation then goes to this committee. But what I'm concerned about, and I was wondering, um, in subsection three and five that I, I already pointed out, it seems to shield any additional information that the committee gets from turning it back over to any sort of prosecution um, or criminal investigation because it says that it must not be disclosed. Uh, could you just speak to that a little bit? Because it seems like whatever information this committee has should be made available to everyone um, in the process. If I'm reading it wrong, please correct me. This may be a situation in which we have to go back to our legal staff and ask about the connections there, but I will go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, directly to the Assemblywoman, I don't interpret it that way. Uh, the goal of the committee is not prosecution. It's not a blame and shame uh, culture. It is truly to identify system gaps and improve the adult maltreatment response across the state on a large scale. However, I do believe the bill allows for referral to the special unit for investigation and prosecution of crimes against older persons, um, which is housed at the Office of the Attorney General, um, if that should develop from the team. And that was something that we added at their request. Um, oh, and the Assemblyman is kindly pointing me directly to it. It is under uh, section 9, or Section 10, I apologize, 3B, and it indicates uh, where they would refer a case to that special unit for further investigation and prosecution if appropriate. Follow up? Yes, please. In that case, I do believe that um, Section 12, Subsection 5, where it says, uh, 
the records of the committee are confidential, are not public records, must not be disclosed, and are not subject to subpoena, discovery, or introduction into evidence in any civil or criminal proceeding may need to change. I'll defer to Legislative Council Beer on that. Thank you so much. We'll have a follow-up with our legal staff on that one um, and get back to you on that. I forgot to direct the committee's attention to the conceptual amendment on this bill as well. Would you like to talk a little bit about the conceptual amendment? So one of the things that ha that came up for me in reading the bill initially as it came to our committee was that it um, the actionable items from the co the newly set up committee was were unclear to me. Um, and so I asked Assemblyman Ornlicker to um, to talk about uh, and and work up a little bit of what what will now happen. You know, once we set up a committee, we like to see actionable things happening from the committee. So the uh, conceptual amendment includes some of those things. If you'd like to go over a few of those. Thank you, Chair. Assemblyman Orrant Licker, for the record, yes, we do want to make sure that the work of this review committee does lead to action. So there will be um, submitting annual reports to the Attorney General and the Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services in the year where it's meeting and other years it goes to the legislature, their report. So we'll hear about it and the AG will hear about it and then the Attorney General will develop a plan to address the findings and develop it so that not only will the Attorney General get the report, but they'll be required to actually uh, take action and at least develop a plan and hold a public hearing uh, for that plan. And then also the, the um, representative from Ms. Richard's office or the committee itself um, will present the findings and policy recommendations to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. So our interim analog will hear the report and have the opportunity to decide what action to take and come back to us. Are there any questions from the committee on the amendment or these additional items? Are there any other questions just generally related to the bill issue? All right, we'll go ahead and move into testimony. I'm going to thank you so much for the presentation. I'm going to ask for support testimony in the physical locations first, and then we'll go to the phones. Um, I will invite anyone in Carson City who would like to provide support testimony on AB 119 to approach the table, please. And if you would like to state your name for the record, you may begin when you're ready. I'm becoming problematic. Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E. Um, I'm a retired psychiatrist neurologist, and that has some relevance because in the last 24 hours of my mother's lucidity after she was uh, hospitalized off and on for two years, she put her head on this shoulder and said, I don't know what I would have done without you. What she really said is, not very many people bring their own neurologists, psychiatrists, pain specialists, masters in public administration with a bad attitude when you screw with his mother. And that changed a lot of the dynamics. When she first came to Reno, having relocated from Roseville, I had to put her into a facility for memory care. That facility allowed her to fall repeatedly, allowed her to lie in bed for a week in her own excrement, did not feed her, did not provide her hydration. She then spent 10 days in St. Mary's recovering from that to go for four months to a rehab facility to basically try and relearn and regain. She never did. She was downhill from that point on. The next memory care unit uh, I admitted her to basically allowed a temporary employee to cut her wedding ring off of her finger that had two diamonds in it. Police report was filed. The employee terminated the next morning and disappeared from Nevada the next day. So elder abuse is the norm. It's not the exception. And I really want to make that point. We are an aging population. We have a lot of people in Nevada who are elderly. This idea of investigating bad things that happen to elderly, frail people is really important. I'm soon to be one, and that scares me. What I saw with my mother, I don't want to happen to other people's mothers. I don't want it to happen to my wife or myself. I ask for your consideration of AB 119. Thank you for your testimony. We 
feel for you and dealing with your mom's um, situation there. I'm grateful that you were there for her. Please go ahead with your when you're ready. State your name and proceed. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, Jonathan Norman, N O R M A N. I'm with the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers, which includes Legal Aid Center in the South, Northern Nevada Legal Aid in the North. And we represent um, protected persons and proposed protected persons. So we have around 20 attorneys. And so we're representing um, thousands of people who are in guardianship, in care facilities. And, and you know, the story that was just shared where you're moving from facility to facility to facility. And I think the, the power of this bill is it's following that thread to identify where, where the system has, has let down our our elderly population and I think that's important for our attorneys because often once you know we're in those cases until the client passes away rarely is it the case where there you know there can be younger clients where they could come out of the guardianship but typically for our elderly we're in it until until they pass away and if there are questions about what happened I think having this organization and this thread to say you know, we as a, we missed a step here where we could have protected someone is really important. So I urge um, your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, is there anyone else in Carson City who would like to provide support testimony on AB 119? Seeing none, we'll move to Las Vegas. I do see we have someone at the desk in Las Vegas. Please remember to state your name for the record. You may begin when you're ready. Chair Peters and members of the committee. My name is Charles Shepard, and I currently serve as the AARP Nevada State President. Today, I testify on behalf of AARP Nevada's 347,000 members. AARP has a long history of fighting for protections for seniors and has been on the forefront of advocacy in the support of federal and state laws and regulations that prevent elder abuse. Elder abuse, like many other forms of domestic abuse, is an often hidden phenomena that affects hundreds of thousands of older Americans. Like other forms of abuse, it often occurs in hidden circumstances and is underreported. A study sponsored by the National Institute of Health estimated that only one in 14 cases of abuse is reported. Older adults who experience elder abuse are likely to number in the hundreds of thousands. Across the country, elder abuse fatality review teams, similar to the proposed Vulnerability Adult Fatality Review Committee of AB 119, examine the deaths of individuals that may be caused by or related to elder or adult abuse with the goal of identifying system gaps and improving victim services. AARP believes that states should support the formation and ongoing operation of multidisciplinary teams like the Adult Fatality Review Committee to address elder abuse issues that cannot be effectively resolved by a single discipline and train professionals from a variety of disciplines, including prosecutors, police officers, sheriffs, lawyers, employees of financial institution, and APS agencies to improve detection, investigation, and enforcement regarding cases of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas who would like to provide testimony in support of AB 119? Seeing none, BPS, are, if there are callers on the line, would you please add those in support of Assembly Bill 119? Chair, there are no callers to participate at this time. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and open um, op to opposition testimony for Assembly Bill 119. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to provide opposition testimony on Assembly Bill 119? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to provide opposition testimony on Assembly Bill 119? Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone on the line who would like to provide opposition testimony on Assembly Bill 119? Chair, we have no callers at this time. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move on to neutral testimony. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 119? Seeing none, is there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 119? 
seeing no one approach the desk, is there anyone, uh, BPS, is there anyone on the public line who would like to provide neutral testimony on Assembly Bill 119? Chair, we have no callers to testify at this time. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite the bill sponsor for closing remarks if you'd like. We're waving the closing remarks. Thank you so much for being here today and presenting this bill. Well, that was the last part of our agenda for today. Are there any closing remarks from folks in the committee? Seeing none, we our next meeting will be on, sorry, oh shoot. It's getting late in the day on a Friday. We have public comment next as our, our last agenda item. Um, we'll go ahead and ask for public comment in Carson City first. Um, for public comment, we are asking for two minute limits on public comment so we can ensure everyone gets an opportunity to speak. You are able to provide public comment in writing in a variety of ways as well in support of in-person public comment if you'd like. We'll start in Carson City and then go to Las Vegas and the phone lines. Is there anyone in Carson City who'd like to provide public comment today? Seeing none, we'll move to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to provide public comment today? Seeing none, is there anyone on the phone line who would like to provide public comment today? Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. So, and thank you, committee, for catching me on that. I appreciate your due diligence. Um, well, that is the end of our day today. Our next meeting will be on Monday, uh, the 6th of March at 1.30 p.m. With that, we are adjourned.